This is Greg Troutwine. I'm with Maritime Reporter TV. We're here with Jim McCall, International Maritime Associates, IMA. And Jim, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, Jim, I know you well, but uh, for our viewers slash readers that don't know your experience, can you give me a brief uh, overview, a brief biography of your career? Well, we, we started uh, IMA back in uh, what, 19, uh, 1970, mm -hmm. 1973. So we've been in operation now for 43 years okay. and uh, set it up as a company to uh, focus on the maritime and the offshore business <clears throat> and uh, been working on that since. Basically do business planning in this sector. Okay. Yeah. So Jim, again, there's probably, we could probably sit here and talk for hours, but uh, in, the, in, the, in the name of brevity, uh, the thing I'd like to touch on first is the energy markets. Obviously, uh, we're about two years into what has been a depressed energy market. Uh, there's signs recently, we're in mid-December 2016, so there's signs recently that the energy markets are coming back. When you look at the energy market today, what do you see? Well, it definitely is uh, on, its, uh, on its rebound. It, the, the rebound really started uh, at the beginning of the year in January when the price of oil hit the bottom. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> it uh, obviously took a big step up when the uh, Saudis finally uh, capitulated and agreed to, the, uh, to reduce production. And the price of oil now is back up to uh, close to $60. Still only half what it had been, mm -hmm. but still... Uh, it's a big improvement. So from the viewpoint of looking at the future, the, uh, the energy business is actually quite, uh, quite good. Okay. Well, obviously the energy business is big and it's diverse. Uh, and there's many different layers and there are many angles that we cover it from. Looking first at the offshore market in general, when you look at the offshore energy production, uh, what, what kind of prospects do you see? Well, I think you first have to start by saying that the, uh, in, in terms of floating production, uh, this business has really been uh, hit terribly over the last uh, two years. Mm -hmm. the, uh, there really hasn't been, there hasn't been an order for any floating production system now since uh, mid-2015, mm -hmm. so we're into almost a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this this is a business that typically had produced uh, somewhere between 12 and 15 contracts each year. So in 2016, there haven't been any contracts at all. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's uh, the history. Now, when you look forward, there are a number of projects in the uh, planning stage. In fact, there's about 200 projects in the planning stage, any one of which could uh, move forward mm -hmm. uh, depending upon the price of uh, oil. Mm -hmm. And if the price of oil stays at $60, X number of uh, those projects will move forward. If the price goes to $100, X times something will move forward. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, but we're looking at over the next, uh, next year, maybe four, five projects uh, actually uh, moving to the stage of uh, contracts. It might even be by the end of this year, two contracts placed. But uh, it's still, uh, it's slow. It'll take time to pick up. The, uh, the industry was uh, really pretty much, uh, it was really hard hit by this uh, downturn. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it does begin to increase, the, uh, um, it's, it does have competition from other sources of, uh, of uh, resources. Okay. Um, I know the history well, uh, but for our viewers, readers that don't know the history well, you have a unique um, insight and knowledge on the floating production business based on a long history studying it. Can you just uh, give a backdrop on the report that you've produced for, and I'm going to say 20 years, but has it been 20 years yet? Yes, it's okay. actually, we first did the, uh, the first report on floating production systems. Uh, well, the very first report that we did as a company on floating production systems was back in uh, about 1980. Mm -hmm. But the uh, actual writing of reports that we did on a monthly or quarterly basis started in uh, 1996. Okay. So we've been at that for now a uh, little over 20 years. Okay. The uh, been at this long enough that uh, many of the, uh, if not all of the projects that were in the planning stage when we first started have either disappeared or turned into uh, contracts. The uh, equipment has been operating and some of those equipment 
some of that equipment has uh, since been scrapped. Okay. So it's, uh, we've gone through the whole cycle on a lot of these projects. You've been in this market for a long time. Put in perspective, if you will, this downturn compared to other downturns that you've seen, how is it similar? How is it different? This has been the worst downturn by far. The, uh, the closest one was in 2007-8, uh, and it's 2007-2008, mm -hmm. when the uh, financial crisis hit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but that was something that affected everyone, and uh, basically that was about a one-year hiatus in, uh, in contracts, okay. about 12-month hiatus. So this one now has gone on for, well, a year and a half uh, since the last contract, and, uh, and in fact, uh, there were only three contracts in 2000. 15 altogether, mm -hmm. none in 2016. The biggest issue though with, the, uh, with this, uh, this turn down is um, as we come out of the downturn, there are two uncertainties that uh, really are very important to uh, keep in mind. One is uh, for the first time uh, really uh, offshore has, had a, has now a, uh, a competitor in the form of shale. And uh, shale production, particularly in this country, is a, is a major source of future energy. And uh, until now, uh, offshore was considered to be the frontier of, uh, uh, of oil production. Now, uh, shale is considered the frontier. Mm -hmm. So uh, the extent to which uh, offshore benefits from the upturn in the business uh, will depend upon the extent to which shale is, uh, is, is competitive with uh, offshore and uh, satisfies the increasing demand. Mm -hmm. The second uh, thing is a little longer term, and that's uh, the uh, last two, well, up until uh, two, three years ago, the <coughs> people that follow this business uh, would talk frequently about the uh, uh, supply side of uh, we're hitting the uh, peak supply that the, we're going to run out of supply of uh, oil supply mm -hmm. of gas that's gone away and now people are talking about the peak demand mm -hmm. and that we are actually at a stage where demand is going to peak mm -hmm. and um, the um, people that look at this the pundits are talking about somewhere in the next uh, could be five years it could be 10 years 15 years mm -hmm. 20 years, but demand uh, is apparently uh, coming to its tapering at this point, and mm -hmm. uh, at some point we'll probably hit the uh, top. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, the supply continues to increase. Mm -hmm. So where does that leave offshore in the long term? Is, is, it's, uh, it's a question. And the, uh, so this is what, what's probably made the big difference between now and past mm -hmm. turndowns. One, I guess if you'd sum it up, one is the downturn has been more severe, mm -hmm. and secondly, coming out of the downturn, the uh, industry is faced with competition from shale and uh, faced with a possible tapering of demand. Okay. Um, kind of a side topic, but relevant as well, is of course the, uh, the issue of renewable energy. Where do you see renewable energy fitting into the energy mix in, in all of this? Yeah, I think renewable energy, if you take away the subsidy, wouldn't exist. So basically, it's the extent to which governments continue to support the uh, renewable energy will determine how, how it uh, develops and uh, expands. But uh, renewable energy is still extremely expensive compared to uh, <coughs> oil and gas, and uh, it's very hard to see re renewable energy really being a major competitor mm -hmm. other than a niche player uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, we've obviously just come off an interesting presidential election, and with uh, uh, President-elect Trump set to take office in about a month's time, I know it's impossible to completely gauge what effect this will have, but in very general terms. A downsizing of emphasis on uh, environmental barriers, mm -hmm. uh, elimination of some environmental barriers, I think it'll there'll be a freeing up of uh, some of the things that uh, the energy developers can, uh, can do. Um, I think this will be uh, beneficial. I think the uh, tax benefits to the energy in industry will continue and mm -hmm. probably expand. And I think there'll just be a very favorable uh, environment for uh, 
providing uh, opportunities for energy companies here in, this, in the U.S. Because we are talking just about the U.S. Mm -hmm. Energy is a worldwide business, and uh, that's a whole different matter. But within the U.S., uh, this, uh, the Trump administration undoubtedly will be good for the energy business. The shale, the development of the shale industry and its impact on the world of energy what do you think this is going to look like in the coming five to ten years? Well, I think there's several aspects of that question. The, uh, um, let me take the first part. Uh, mm -hmm. What impact uh, could be had on uh, the international market? One of the uh, things that is, is talked about here in this uh, new administration is uh, the possibility of creating barriers mm -hmm. on uh, people on countries importing oil to the U.S., exporting oil to the U.S. And uh, to the extent uh, any type of barriers are created or any threat of barriers are created, that has an impact potentially of disrupting the oil market, mm -hmm. causing oil prices to get volatile. And any volatility in the business uh, is probably detrimental to the international market. Mm -hmm. So that could happen. So in other words, the new administration could actually shake up the international market mm -hmm. by its actions to create uh, possible uh, tariffs and barriers. Mm -hmm. But as far as shale, the uh, shale production in this country is going to grow like, uh, probably gr grow very rapidly mm -hmm. over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, there, there's one field, for example, in the uh, Permian Basin in western Texas that's considered to have a huge amount of uh, resources that are uh, recoverable. And uh, the uh, companies that operate in this area in the shale business talk about, uh, you know, figures on shale production in the U.S. that are really quite uh, astronomical. Mm. I mean, they're on the scale of uh, uh, the North Sea or, or uh, what used to be in Alaska. In fact, they're even higher than that in some cases. So... Uh, Shale production could expand very rapidly. The uh, productivity of shale is increasing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but like all subjects, it's complex. You, you know, you can simply say it simply that shale is becoming very productive. Mm -hmm. Or you could dig into it in more detail and ask what's really happening. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a more complicated subject. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, the uh, shale is a... Uh, is definitely a threat to, mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely going to fill a big part, it's going to fill an increasing part of the uh, oil demand requirement over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. Let's uh, shift to something that's a little nearer and dearer to our heart, uh, the maritime industry. And again, I know you have a, uh, a long history in, in this uh, sector as well. Um, shipbuilding in the United States, when you look at it today, what do you see? Well, there's not very much, uh, but the, uh, there's only several shipyards left uh, compared to the, uh, the old days when there were shipyards on all three coasts uh, very actively uh, producing ships. And in mm -hmm. fact, if you go back to World War II, this was an enormously productive uh, country to build ships. Mm -hmm. uh, but shipbuilding moves around. It, it, it was very active in this country and World War II, and then it shifted to Japan in uh, the 60s, and then to Korea in the 70s, and then to China in the, what, 90s mm -hmm. or 2000 period. And, uh, and each country has had its own share of problems trying to keep the shipbuilding activity going. China is now having its own set of problems uh, mm -hmm. trying to rationalize their shipbuilding uh, base. So uh, there's a lot of shipbuilding capacity in the world. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems with shipbuilding is once you create it, it's kind of hard to, it goes, the, the yard may close, but the facility remains. And uh, like down in Brazil, like the old Ishibras, Ishibras yard uh, mm -hmm. gets reactivated, brought mm -hmm. back into operation. Uh, the, in the U.S., the, uh, there's a combination of uh, building some ships for the uh, Jones Act. Uh, and there are a number of tankers under construction at this point. Um, it's a question of where that's going because the uh, uh, the increasing amount of shale is creating a uh, demand for tankers down in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, but uh, uh, it's possible at some point the uh, shale will grow to the point where the uh, crude will be directly exported uh, mm -hmm. 
and then it could go off in uh, non-U.S. built ships. But mm -hmm. for the time being, there are there's a demand for coastal tankers. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, the uh, there's the usual uh, requirement for lots of domestic uh, vessels, uh, harbor tugs. Uh, small passenger vessels, uh, all sorts of small craft that'll keep the workboat shipyards uh, active. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a big market, uh, but it's not like, say, the uh, you'd have to go back to the uh, 50s and 60s to find, well, actually the 40s, to find the real production in this country. <laughs> so. Again, the political question uh, with the new administration, um, you know, I, I remember when I entered this industry, went back into the, the Ronald Reagan and the 600-ship Navy. When you look at U.S. Navy shipbuilding and the new administration coming in, what do you think the possibilities are for reinvigorated naval shipbuilding in the U.S.? I think there's a possibility that the uh, naval shipbuilding will increase. Uh, in the administration, Mr. Trump is talking about this, but uh, uh, it'll be a question of looking at where the priorities are. I know there's a lot of interest in uh, spending money on cyber security and mm -hmm. things like that, and uh, Trump is already talking about uh, challenging the, uh, what is it, the contract, the F-32, the, the, mm -hmm. the Lockheed contract on the aircraft, and uh, the Boeing contract on the uh, the... Uh, the plane they're building for him mm -hmm. uh, in the future. Uh, it's a question of whether the, uh, the, the new Secretary of Defense, the new, new president, will uh, look at shipbuilding as na naval ships as really a priority mm -hmm. or uh, not. Uh, at the moment, it's all, everything's being talked up as a priority, mm -hmm. but uh, every Every aspect of defense has to be increased, but sooner or later they have to make some decisions, mm -hmm. and it'll be a question of what's more pri a higher priority: building another aircraft carrier or increasing cybersecurity. Okay. And I don't think that question's been answered. Okay. You know. That's very good. Again, Jim, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Absolutely. And this is Greg Troutwine with Maritime Reporter TV.